our next speaker. Uh, rarely have I seen the female keynote speaker at the conference. I'm very proud to uh, introduce our next speaker. She has been in academic for over 30 years and is currently at the Wawasan Open University in Penang, Malaysia, where she actively promotes the importance and value of student engagement for uh, student success. She has thought, researched, and contributed to the development of the University of Malaya, International Medical University, Open University Malaysia, and also the uh, Somorona University in Jakarta. As Malaysia's e-learning pioneer, uh, she has been championing the need to use appropriate learning technologies and to decide effective but efficient instruction for blended and online learning. She has contributed significantly to the development of the open and distant learning since 2004. She has written over 800 articles as a newspaper columnist and has spoken as keynote and invited speakers around the world. She is also a member of the ASEAN Cyber University Project and also was named second among the top 14 leaders in educational technology in Southeast Asia and received an Education Leadership Award in 2014. Distinguished participants, may I proudly present Professor Dr. Roslani Wati Abbas. Okay. Good morning. Wow, this is loud. <laughs> Good morning and uh, Sawadika. Thank you for being here this morning. I would also like to thank uh, an old friend, uh, somebody who I met, I think, more than five years ago, Ajanta Pani. Actually, more than 10 years ago, yeah, in Malaysia. And she has been br bringing me to Thailand once in a while to share some of uh, what we've done, my ideas, and so on. Okay, um, you know, actually, I didn't know I was going to speak in this grand hall until about two weeks ago when I got the program. And then I thought, oh dear, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of people. And um, I hope to be able to share with you my ideas and my perspective on uh, MOOCs. My advantage is I come from the older technology when we first started using OHPs. And today, of course, uh, we can be delivering courses 
to anyone around the world using whatever, media, uh, whatever platforms that we can get our hands on. And today, of course, we have not only the learning management systems, but we also have social media. And that's very powerful when you combine them together. Okay, let me share with you, when I was asked for a title, okay, let me just add the word designing for MOOCs and beyond, which is your theme. Of course, I didn't know what I was going to say yet at that time, but as, I, uh, as the days progress, I was giving a lot of thought to what I should say. This is from my perspective, based on my experience for the last, I think, 38 years since I first used the microcomputer. Uh, it started with computer literacy and then went on and on, computer-assisted instruction, um, multimedia, and after that, online learning. And of course, having been in the Open Distance Learning Institution for, I think, maybe about a dozen years, a lot of things have changed. So let me just share with you my perspective of what should be, um, or what could be uh, for MOOCs and beyond. Okay, now, is this on? It's not moving. Uh, okay. All right, MOOCs and Beyond is a theme, and uh, welcome to the conference. I think uh, Ajahn Tapani and team has done a good job in bringing everybody here today. And let me ask you, how many of you are from the universities, and how many of you from school, universities? Okay, that looks like about half. How about the school system? School? Not too many, maybe mostly university. Okay, good, then it makes my uh, presentation easier. First of all, greetings from Wawasan Open University. We are located in Penang, Malaysia. Penang is an island, it's called Pearl of the Orient. It's also a heritage uh, city, and uh, when you come, there's history, there's good food, and hopefully good education as well. Um, we have two buildings. Um, the front, the white building, is called the Heritage House, or the Heritage Building. And um, this is where the main administration is, uh, the main administration offices are held. And then the building in the back is a donation by one of the philanthropists in Malaysia. Uh, 12 stories high, and this is where classes are held and where um, faculty and administrators' offices are located. So when you come to Penang, let me know. I'll try to uh, meet you and maybe give you a tour of the university. Before that, I should have said that behind the tall building is the ocean. So from my office, I can also see the ocean. So view of the sea. Sometimes I see ferries go by, sometimes I see cruise ships go by. So there's life on the ocean. But I also see um, reclamation vessels because islands are being created right outside. And I think Ajahn Tapani has seen this when you were in Penang last year. So Penang is changing as well. And of course, like uh, any other thing, universities also have to change. We have to adapt to the 21st century needs. We have to adapt to industry needs. We have to adapt to um, what a citizen should be, uh, adapt to um, what they need and uh, what we can do for them. Okay, this is, I'm stuck again. <laughs> Okay, maybe I have to be, do it from here. No? Oh. Okay, this is my agenda for this morning. Just a little bit of history about MOOCs. And then about what else MOOCs could be about why MOOC, just a, little, just a little perspective from there, and then talk about redesigning MOOCs, and then uh, designing for learner engagement, and then give some concluding remarks. So that's my outline. Okay, a little bit of history. Now, many of you are familiar with this, but let me just um, 
uh, give you a screen capture of what, um, uh, in terms of growth of MOOCs, the statistics. In 2012, as rightly mentioned by our previous speaker, uh, Paul, uh, the first known MOOC uh, was the MOOC on Artificial Intelligence from Stanford University. So that began in, sometime in 2012. And today we've got over 9,000 plus uh, speaker, uh, courses on MOOC. So a growth of, what, 9,000% over the last eight years. We've also got some top MOOC providers. The top five are Coursera, edX, uh, Zutang, X uh, from China, Udacity, and FutureLearn. So just a very quick capture. And uh, 81 million students have taken MOOCs 800, from 800 plus universities offering the MOOCs, and then 9,400 courses. So that's been quite a significant development. Um, let me share with you my first C MOOC, C MOOC rather than the X MOOC that you find on Coursera and Udacity and all. The first C MOOC, my first C MOOC experience as a facilitator was when George Siemens contacted me and said, can you give a MOOC? I said, oh, what was that? <laughs> and this was way back in 2011. I didn't know what it was, but he told me it's just for one week. What happened was I think they had a series of 50 people, uh, e-learning, basically those in EdTech and e-learning, uh, 50 people lined up, and that was week two. Week one was introduction. Okay. Week two was me. In a way, it's good to be the first one because I don't have any benchmark, so I just did whatever I, did, uh, whatever I could think of. Basically, to give and share uh, content and knowledge. And that's all he asked me to do. Okay, I did that. Um, because of the time zone difference, I think it was like 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. Malaysian time. <laughs> yeah, I should be in bed, but I tried to stay awake to give this one hour session. And they had, um, I think they were using Grasshopper or something uh, to capture my so called lecture, to share with, at that time, almost 100 learners from all over the world. This, this is not a uh, graduate course. This was not for formal learning. But I thought it was interesting. After I had given my, my so-called lecture, I realized that students, well, the so-called students, um, were involved in this um, learning that were on different paths. Because after my session, they blocked about what I had said. Um, they had, um, some of them even captured my presentation and then they talked about it. I mean, it was just on different platforms, different people doing different things. And till today, I remember the impact of it because I thought, hey, this is a very good way to learn. Not didactic only, but there were discussions after that. And then you don't know what the dis where the discussion was going uh, to, towards, and you don't know what platforms they were going to use. But I have a reason for saying that because I want to relate it back to towards the end of my presentation. And I realized that it was, uh, other, than just, other than giving and sharing content and knowledge, it was making the connections. Yeah, allowing others to make the connections from what I said to whatever they were, uh, whatever prerequisite knowledge they had, or to whatever new knowledge they were going to contribute. And it was about going with the flow while connecting the dots. It, there was no formal assessment for this MOOCs, uh, for the C MOOCs, and um, it was at that time the connectivist approach that George Siemens and, and Stephen Downs uh, were promoting. You know what the connectivist approach is? Some people say it's not a theory of learning, although they are trying to forward it as a theory of learning. But whatever it is, it is the connectivist approach where when you use the internet, you just connect from one point to another. And uh, with the CMOOCs, you never know what learning treasures you will uncover. You will never know the learning pathway. You don't know who else you will, will, you'll be learning with. You don't know how deep you can go while you learn. And you don't know the knowledge or the wisdom you will end up with. There were no learning outcomes, basically. Yeah? OK. 
came. Okay, I know why. Because this uh, screen is keep, keeps coming up. You don't see it, but the, the BTEC uh, networking screen comes up. Okay, this was the um, um, website for the uh, MOOC, CMOOC platform. And uh, today, most of the MOOCs are ex-MOOCs. What are they like? They are structured in presentation, in terms of content, and more like the, class, the traditional classroom model, but it's online. And uh, I personally have a problem with this, maybe because I'm not a student, but I want to learn new things. So when I t take some of these uh, co courses, I find that there's too much content. For one week, sometimes six videos to watch, 10 minutes each. I took a, a finance course, I think about a couple of years ago, I tried, I told myself, okay, I'm going to try and finish this course, 14 weeks, but in the end, after two weeks, I got <laughs> a little bit tired, you know, from watching one video after another, even though I speeded up the video. You know what I mean, yeah? So, that learning style does not fit my style. I don't know about you, but, um, um, so actually, what, today what I'm going to address is not MOOCs, uh, for university so much, but MOOCs for lifelong learner and uh, for the lifelong learner as well as um, uh, from the, what you call this, personal enrichment perspective. Okay, I find that ex-MOOCs are not as, revolution uh, uh, not as revolutionary um, other than it being online. I also find that it's more pedagogical in approach rather than andragogical. If you are an educationist, you'll know what I mean. Okay. It takes the form of didactic rather than for the adult learner who wants to explore on their own, who wants to have a free hand about where they want, what they want to do, who they want to learn with, and so on. I find that XMOOCs are more about information dissemination, pretty much our, like our traditional courses in the classroom. And with thousands of students, you can't expect more than uh, you can't expect too much feedback from the facilitator. At best, there are tutors, TAs usually, if, in the case of the United States, um, online with you. So there's low quality feedback from course facilitator. To me, there's low learner engagement. I'll share with you what learner engagement is later on. And of course, because of that, it's shallow learning. I would prefer that when we learn, we go deep. Maybe because I've been teaching more of postgraduate courses, I want my students to go deep, and I want my students to get what they want for their own use, their own value, rather than what we want, and it stops the same, because assessment will dictate that. And of course, there's no, um, I mean, if you're taking it for free, usually there's no formal assessment. And uh, it tends, of course, it, it tends to take the behaviorist approach, and uh, of course, if you want the full experience, you have to pay for it. So that's basically what XMOOCs are today. I mean, this is based on my list. Can you agree with me on that one, if you're familiar with MOOCs? More or less? Okay. Okay, <clears throat> now this is what George Siemens uh, uh, says, and I would like to quote him. The MOOC has promoted the acceptance of online learning and enabled change and diversification in the way that education in the classroom and online is delivered. Okay, at best, it's promoted online learning, which I personally thank, because, because I've gone into online learning since, I think, 2008, 100% online learning, designed a, a postgraduate program called the Masters of Instructional Design and Technology, so, um, so since 2008, well, 2008 we designed, 2009 January we delivered to students from all around the world, from Finland to Indonesia, also covering the Indian continent and the African continent, also the Caribbean islands. So that's where our learners come from. Some of them have PhDs but are taking this program because they're going to develop or going to, to manage an online distance learning program. So that's why they took the course. And it's been a very interesting experience from struggling to find the right platform at the beginning, 
to deliver this 100% online course because you never meet them. Everything is online for a period of about 14 weeks. And, uh, and uh, because of MOOCs, now online learning is popular. So I appreciate the fact that MOOC has made an influence. Not sure how to turn this off, but uh, okay, I just have to go back and forth. My question to you, to the audience, is are we, hap are we happy with the way MOOCs have been designed and implemented? If you're familiar with the traditional way of learning, if you enjoy that approach, then of course you will be very happy. But for someone like me, I think there's more to it. I think there's more to it. So then, next I'm going to ask, are you happy with, the, with what we have achieved through MOOCs? Question for you, you think about it. Now what else could MOOCs be? What else? Is it more of the same? More of the same. We have some MOOCs, we do the same thing, replicate. But maybe different courses by different people, and maybe your university instead of other universities. Or could it be enhanced learning? Could, MOOC, could the new MOOCs be enhanced learning from X MOOCs, and then consider C MOOCs, and then consider something that I will mention later, W MOOCs? And could it be more credit-bearing opportunities? Because right now, uh, some universities are acknowledge, acknowledging the fact that if you have a certificate, uh, the student will be given the credit. But could it be more of that? Because some universities are not. Could it be more platforms? And I hear that some uh, countries or some universities are toying with using other platforms. Could it be more choices? Could it be more of what else? Yeah. So there's some of the questions. Now, when I explored um, recently, I found that there are MOOC-based degrees already. You pay quite a bit. For example, the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science is nine to 17,000 pounds. This is offered by the University of London on Coursera. That's quite a bit, but then you can remain where you are and take a course from the UK. There's also a Master of Science in Accounting from the University of Illinois, again on Coursera, and the cost is about 30,000 USD. So now everything is becoming commercialized, not so cheap, not so cheap. So this is happening. I'm not going to talk to you about it, I'm just sharing uh, this information. Now why MOOC? Now because of this you know, what else is happening? Why MOOC? Why do we still want to consider MOOCs? I'm going to share with you the point of view of a MOOC enthusiast. I would label this person as a lifelong learner. Let's see what she says. And incidentally, I presented this three years ago, this conference, and I shared at that time 25 ways of MOOCing, uh, but one person's perspective of why she goes into MOOCs is this. I can, develop, I can develop myself academically and professionally. At that time, she was a master's student. I can design my own educa education and learning. I can do my own self-based learning. I can learn anytime, anywhere, and on any device. I can learn from the good, better, and the best lecturers or subject matter experts from around the world. I can get certificates from the top international universities or MOOC providers. I can learn with and from international course mates. Isn't that a good reason? Do some of you relate to this? Just do any of you relate to this? Is this a good reason to MOOC? Yes. Okay. Now, what if now, you know ASEAN, ASEAN economy, ASEAN is supposed to be together now, right? It's an open economy now. However, I find that we have not, it's not that much different from before we, you know, have this ASEAN economy. And I'm wondering, because sometimes when I go to different ASEAN countries, people ask me about Malaysia. And I'm surprised with some of the 
questions. They said, do you have the same food? <laughs> because they don't know how close we can be, how sometimes things are different, and we can appreciate that difference. So I'm thinking, maybe we should have uh, some courses that will benefit the ASEAN uh, citizen. Okay, so how about regional integration through shared learning experiences via online learning communities? It could be MOOCs, yeah? But we have to set up a very intense community of learners. So we have massive open online learning. Nothing's changed. But can we increase the openness? Can we enhance the learning experience? And can we, as a result of learning from the MOOCs, become informed, learned, and wise? for practical reasons. Uh, this is what George Siemens also says. What is being ignored is the development of a new learning ecology. Can we take advantage of this? Serving an audience that higher education has ignored to date. So let's think about this. And uh, adding value to MOOCs, and again I'm thinking now, I, I'm from the Open and Distance Learning Institution. I think the credit-bearing courses are useful. Beyond that, MOOCs can also be a form of personal enrichment of our own selves. Learn whatever we want, and MOOCs offer us that, because it's, it's out there, so many to choose from. And then, of course, to support our lifelong learning needs. And at the end of it, to, to have to achieve this regional integration, the creation of regional communities. Let me expand on some of this. Um, what I believe needs to happen is to design the courses for learner engagement. Remember I was telling you, you know, every week you have like six, eight videos. I don't know whether that's learner engagement. To me, it's not so. It's just listening one way. <laughs> you are always nodding, eh? because you said you took a lot of MOOCs, right? So you understand what I'm saying. All right, so could there be more to just listening or watching videos and, or, or reading, you know? And after that, coming back and then answering all this, you know, whatever questions that we get. Now, what about this learner engagement in online learning? Of course, we have the, norm, the, the usual learning outcomes, uh, learning content, and now, of course, the activities and the assessment. That's a normal course. But if we can think, can do a little bit different, what if, in the, at the end of it, it's not, it's not to um, be able to respond to the assessments provided, to the formal assessments, but it's more about building our own knowledge and wisdom. And at the end, of course, we, ex we, we attain the satisfaction and the success, but based on our own personal perspective. So my perspective was the lifelong learner and for the personal enrichment, more that, more that than the others, because, because the others are being talked, talked about by so many others. Now this is, um, I have got five uh, points there. I had asked my online students because you know when you're de delivering an online course, to engage them is not so easy. And I don't give lectures. I will share some videos, I will share some things to be read, and after that, they go off on their own tangent. But what the learning happens, what I can see, um, uh, what you call this, how their learning has evolved, or what learning are they going through? I can see that through forums. So my emphasis is always on forums. And some of them, they write for one posting, one entire page. If you were to print, it's one A4 page, single spacing, or one and a half pages of what, I mean, of the responses to the, to the media that I post online. And I like that because I also learn from them, because it comes from their perspective, maybe their working experience or their learning experience, and then they share with others. And another student posts based on that. So that's the kind of learning I enjoy. So I ask these students of mine, I ask a question, I say I'm going to be presenting a paper at that time in Riyadh. So this is a screenshot, so if you see there, it's 2013 Riyadh. And I ask them, what do you think 
uh, takes. What does it take to be engaged in learning? So they're saying to be engaged in learning means to be self-motivated to learn. That's very powerful. And then learning engagement refers to a situation where the instructor encourages learners to take an active role in their own learning by giving them practical task, practical task that will promote information processing and understanding of concepts. Now, these are their words, yeah? It's not my words. Another student says, I think that this means for the learner to be active, actively involved in all learning activities through interacting with the instructor, the peers, the web, and the learning material. Another student, it also means that the task must be able to maintain the student's interest and so must include tasks designed to challenge the student's problem-solving abilities, reasoning, evaluation skills, and other cognitive abilities. And another student, learning engagement involves learners in authentic tasks to involve problem-solving. So authentic has been repeated a few times, so that's what they want. These are the adult learners' andragogical approach. Okay, this is a very interesting model, a very powerful model that I personally have adopted when I do my online courses. You may want to go back and explore. Right now, it is on the Athabasca website, Athabasca University. Community of Inquiry, uh, Anderson and Garrison had a lot to do at the very beginning, years ago. And uh, I first uh, saw this, I think, in 2000, maybe 2010. And I've got some papers on this. And um, what it says is basically, we want to create an educational experience that is based on three important presence. Social presence, cognitive presence, teaching presence. When I do my courses, I try to make these three elements come into play or come into being. Okay, teaching presence, what is that? This is 100% online, yeah? What is teaching presence? Basically, the students will feel that the teacher is there, although the teacher may not be there um, for a whole week, but they feel that the teaching presence is there. What is social presence? Social presence is when the students feel that this is a trustworthy platform, they will get positive responses and not be criticized for the wrong reasons, that they will grow as a learner. So the platform must be friendly, uh, the environment must be um, uh, an, an environment that respects the students, you know, and so on. Cognitive presence. Now, we're dealing with adult learners. I, t I mentioned to you some of the students that I had were PhDs, PhD holders. Some of them were directors of uh, units. Okay, cognitive presence is something where they feel that they are cognitively challenged. The level Okay, Michael can help me with that if you can. I don't see that on my screen, <laughs> so that's why it's not easy. Okay, so cognitive uh, presence is when you pose, I guess that's, what, that's why they wanted that authentic task. Okay, authentic learning. And, um, and uh, cognitive presence is when they are challenged at the right level. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. At the right level, Michael is always very helpful. He's the one very perceptive. Good to have him around. <laughs> okay, so cognitive presence again, at the right level, for the right thing, for the right purpose, authentic learning. That means if it's authentic learning, they will be able to relate very easily. And they like that. So for adult learners, we have to have this. And um, when we achieve all these three well, we will have this beautiful educational experience for our students. Of course, social presence and cognitive presence, according to the Community of Inquiry Framework, supports the discourse. So people will feel uh, safe 
and and then they feel that they will be respected yeah for their opinions and so on and you know they're challenged at the right cognitive le level so they will go into this forum discussions uh, deep you know go into deep discussions social presence and teaching presence when you have it it is to set the climate and of course between this and this cognitive and teaching presence um, it is also about the teacher selecting the right content. And the content need not be your own content. There are so many things out there, OERs, YouTube videos, Vimeo maybe, you know, so many things, even infographics. Just choosing the right thing. Now, it is a challenge for the, for the facilitator of the course to find something relatable and something useful, valuable, and so on. That takes quite a, quite a lot of time. Okay, my concluding remarks. I don't know whether you got what I wanted to say. I'm trying to explain as best as I can. Um, because maybe some of you are new to MOOCs, some of you who are not so new maybe can understand me better. But um, if you don't understand, it's okay, it's an exposure. And, but what I hope is you will think a little bit, you know, after this. Concluding remarks, okay. The path forward to me is, no, I'm not seeing this on my computer. Oh dear, I'm not seeing this on my computer, um, so I can't, I can't close that screen. But basically the path forward is, we always get information from our courses. If you are a student, it's always information, lots of information from the textbook, from the lecturer, maybe from the PowerPoint slides, you know, it's always information. And that to me is the ex -mooks. Thank you again, Michael. And then we have, after the next stage of the information is to gain knowledge from whatever course you enrolled in. And that to me, easily achieved through CMOOCs because you, you go to, to, to learning paths that that are unplanned, are unplanned, it's your personal learning paths. So you build knowledge as you go along because it is what you want, you know? So you find the right uh, connections or the right dots and put it, you know, in your learning pathway. And of course, the ultimate is to gain wisdom from the courses that you take, from the interactions that you have with the other learners, um, uh, from the materials that you interact with from you know, that community of inquiry framework, once that is well achieved, you will get that to the level of wisdom. And that's what I think, you know, if, for example, um, he wanted that uh, uh, regional integration, perhaps courses on what I'm thinking of is ASEAN studies. Maybe something that all undergrads have to take to understand what ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN community is all about, to understand aspects of uh, each ASEAN country. It could be culture and traditions, it could be uh, finance, it could be um, anything, you know? We can always set a curriculum for this. So what if we had this ASEAN studies at the undergraduate level, and maybe in the last year of the student's uh, uh, program of studies, take this course and understand each other I think there's value to that. Instead of now, courses in silo. And then there's no ultimate purpose, you know, except for just the information or the knowledge. So I would like to call that the W MOOC. Okay, what is wisdom? Just to remind ourselves, it is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. That's what we need, I think, as a human being, before we can you know, contribute to everything else around us. So W MOOC. <laughs> w MOOC. And um, well, we can always say, you know, it's about being wise through MOOCs and beyond, okay? Okay, that's it.
Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or suggestions, I, I would like to hear them. So maybe just one question is allowed because we are a bit uh, behind the schedule. Mm. One question. Hopefully there's one. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise everybody is hungry and want to go. Okay, none? Perhaps. Okay, please. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I have a question on because you're talking about the social patient. So social if, presence. Yeah, if we put the like uh, um, um, like for example, we combine the Facebook line and the MOOC together. Yes. How how is that? That will be, be good. Yep. Yes. So social presence is about creating a presence where people are comfortable, people feel that their opinions will be respected, and uh, nowadays, of course, people are comfortable with social media, especially when they want to access through mobile phones. So combining a MOOC platform with social media is one form of uh, creating an increased social presence. Thank you for that comment. All right. Okay. So thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, Professor Roshani Wati Abbas.